Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guy. Well, good afternoon. I have a lot to cover, and I'm really excited about doing it. But I think I'm going to have to lead into it this way. I have a screenshot of my website, and it's been up, like I said, for quite a while. And it's a collaborative effort. My wife, my brother, they've all thrown themselves into this wholeheartedly for quite a number of years because they feel very strongly about the topic. And the topic, you can kind of see here, the screen still that I have from the site has to do with the occult nature of UFOs. And I uh, tried to set the site up so that it would be a compendium uh, of information for the people who, if they were surfing and they had a question about ufology, that they might be able to find some information that wouldn't be just purely secular or slanted towards one religious idea or another. And the way I thought it might work best then, and I think it's almost divine providence, was to come up with a word that seemed to have a double meaning. And that word is watcher. That's why the site's named the Watcher website. Number one, I was trying to draw in the, uh, the ufologist who is an aficionado who understands that the abductee has been hearing these abductors tell them that their names are the Watchers. And very early on, I think in the 70s, that that uh, fact had come out and that was in, intensely interesting to me. It was fascinating because I have a background in theology. I immediately recognized that that word was very integral to the cosmology and the, the theocracy of the early, the early civilizations, not just the Semitic civilization, not just the Hebrew civilization, we're talking about the Greeks, we're talking about the Sumerians, we're talking about almost everything in the Middle East that you can think. They have an idea that there was an interaction between heavenly beings from a very, very distant part of antiquity and that those heavenly beings had a, a very forceful role in, in events later on in, in history. The other side of this explanation for the name for the site is that as a Christian we're told to watch for the second advent of the Messiah. And well, that's just a real basic tenet of Christianity that the Messiah came already and, and he'll come again. And around this uh, understanding that the Messiah comes again is a whole body of study, eschatology, the science of things that will be, that outline what world events will be taking place. Now, this Bible prophecy, this scripture prophecy, talks about uh, a, a recapitulation, a re repetition of what happened, especially in antediluvial times. The word that's used is talks about the time before Noah. And there's a lot of speculation about what time that was. However, on my site, we talk about these things, and we have secular viewpoints, we have theological viewpoints that cover hundreds, uh, hundreds of years of research. But I think the name Watcher is very integral to this whole point, this whole lecture that I'm going to give you, because if we understand who the Watchers are as they themselves explain, both, both in the past and now in the, in the present, we'll get a very clear view of what the UFO phenomena is, uh, a glimpse into even seriology, the study of crop circles, and most especially the connection between Mars and Earth and whether or not there are artificial structures on Mars like Richard Holden contends and I think he does so with a lot of merit. So here we go. I'd like to direct you to this little guy right down here. He's a classic alien gray. My brother actually drew this picture and copied it later on after he was inspired through a talk we had about Philip Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. And the whole idea was that in his book he said that uh, the Roswell crash did happen, our Air Force did recover P-51 
pieces of this craft and that they were quickly classified and then later he came across documents that detailed how all this all these parts were put back into the private sector of our of our uh, economic infrastructure so that they could be back engineered and then put into technology that we're using today like this like my computer integrated circuitry and that sort of thing so you can see in the hand of this little alien gray who I have to keep reminding myself is a watcher also um, he has a tetrahedron and that was a little later we put this in about 1997 it was a link to go to uh, my brother's encryption privacy privacy shareware which was something he had developed on his own it was just an encrypt email so no one could read him and it was actually a pretty good uh, privacy shareware that he had set up but it was kind of a you know, tongue-in-cheek sort of ploy to put an alien uh, purveying this type of technology and the tetrahedron connects to Richard Holden's work with uh, the uh, angles that are measured in the Cydonia site on Mars these intelligent angles these designs that seem to re repeat uh, a tetrahedral geometry and a tetrahedral geometry of course the first of the platonic solids which this alien is holding is, is indic indicative of that idea now, this is a close-up view of it here this is the original picture he was holding an integrated circuit which I think is the focus of uh, where this technology what we were talking about with the Philip Corso book where it came from it seems to have been miraculously developed and the more my brother talked about just how intricate these sort of things were how the uh, chemical uh, makeup of this chip seemed to be so random that it really did make a lot of sense it sounds fringe and and uh, loony but we were still doing this kind of as a ruse and this is 1996 this is a, a crop glyph uh, you can see calling them crop circles because it's clearly not a circular structure except for the thing that this aliens holding but it appeared in 2002 August 14th outside of Winchester England and the photographer Lucy Pringle had also interviewed some folks who live near this uh, strange feature that showed up in a wheat field right around harvest time and they had witnessed lights swirling around and then zooming into the sky and also strange pulsing noises that they assumed were a generator or maybe a helicopter but this feature is huge it's about 390 feet tall by 240 feet wide and the circular feature that this alien gray is holding this watcher is holding is about 100 feet across you can see the the tractor lines here the little roadway and uh, you can get some idea of the scale it's amazing about this feature is its similarity to the ultratech symbol that my brother had put up on my site I thought it was significant although I had some reservations you know because I want to keep a, a mind that isn't delusional and I decided that maybe I would put it aside and wait till some inspiration hit me if it actually did have some merit with my research although now I'm finding that it does and it it surely did here's some folks walking around in the disk as you can see here this thing they're walking around and studying it and it, it, it actually has some remarkable features it was actually a readable code in the disk it was called ASCII text and that just stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange uh, it was an American code developed in the late 60s what happens with this code is it's a system of binary eight digits zeros or ones which make one symbol and it's all correlated to a keyboard for a computer so if you type a it'll be zero zero one one zero something like that it depends on what the letter is that's what this code had in it 
There were 26 words in this message, and you can see the actual message was decoded rather rapidly after this crop circle showed up. It's distinctive because it's so innocuous and vague. It says, beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. Believe. There is good out there. We oppose deception. Conduit closing, bell sound. That's as far as this understanding of this crop circle went. The researchers who looked into it decided that there was nothing that said it was a fate or that it had man-made features. It had all the bona fide hallmarks of a actual uh, uh, crop circle as defined by seriologists, the guys who've actually coined this, this uh, uh, study, seriology. They've actually pioneered studies of how these these grains, these stalks of grain are laid out, how you can actually examine them microscopically and find that the nodes that the plant have have been exploded. They can be laid down in weaved patterns. There's, there's so many things about this crop circle that were uh, right on the mark for the real phenomena that most researchers were baffled. They said, okay, if, if this really is an alien communication, why would they use American standard code why would they use American text? Why would they put out such a cliche picture? It, it just seems a little bit far-fetched, and so it was just kind of left alone. And there is more to it. In fact, there's so much to this that I think you could exhaust years studying it, and you wouldn't end your uh, discoveries. For example, the most basic thing is there are actually 59 lines of horizontal resolution in the picture. And I counted them out very meticulously, but I've also verified this with other sites that have worked on this. 59 lines of resolution, and as you can see, the alien is holding this disc so that it's bisected along the exterior of his frame. So I thought that perhaps he was indicating that we should count the lines along that frame in which I did meticulously numbering to 33, which is a significant number if you know about illuminated fraternities and their rank. And what is this all going to lead to? It begged an equation. I, I realized really quickly that 59 minus 33 equals 26, which interesting, interestingly relates to the number of words that are in the disk itself. Also, 26 is the number of letters in our English alphabet. But if you multiply these two numbers together, I wonder if anybody can see where I'm going with this. Does anyone not know when the Roswell event happened? That's right, 19, 1947. Later, when I, I recovered from my shock, I realized that 33% of 59 is 19.47 the hallmark signature of tetrahedral geometry that Holden talks about in the Martian Cydonia region over and over and over again. And I think the correlation between these two numbers is, is obvious here with these integers that we have set up in the crop circle. And there's more to it than that. Now, I was talking about the ASCII code having, having uh, uh, letters. They, it represents letters, spaces, uh, uh, numbers. So in the 26 word message, there were 151 ASCII characters. And I made sure that that was correct too. It took me quite a, a while because I realized once I had pegged what this number was and it was wrong, I would be led in the wrong direction. But something that's very interesting is all these equations that you're gonna see are hinged on that number. So, you have 151 times 33, you get 4,983. It's Roswellian. It's exactly the distance in miles along the curvature of the Earth from the latitude and longitude of where this crop circle showed up outside of Winchester, England, and the, the uh, actual crash sites 
of the Roswell incident. And for those skeptics out there, I actually plugged it into a, a uh, program on the web that you can actually do these things with. And I kept, of course, almost a holistic idea, this idea of 33 repeated over and over again. And then, in fact, if you look at the historical traditional site of the Roswell crashes, it is centered along the 33rd point three three latitude mark in Roswell, New Mexico. Now if you take those two numbers again and add them, still using 33, you come up to 184, which is exactly the number of days in a year before you hit July 4th. And even on a leap year, you're still going to end up the day before. And there's been conjecture when the actual crash event took place. It allows for this. There's a little 24-hour section here where it ends and then the fourth begins. Now, as there was 151 characters in this code, 26 words, each character has eight bits of information in it. That equals 1,208 bits of ASCII code. That's significant, too, because there's exactly 1,208 miles from the latitude of the crop circle to 33.33 degrees latitude of Roswell. And then I also plugged it in here so you can see that there's a little room for error. I didn't know exactly the coordinates outside of Winchester, England, and I had a pretty good idea where the crash site is northwest of Roswell. As you can see, it's very, very tight. Now here's a piece de resistance. And as a segue, the Europeans are mostly more open than the American press when they look at this phenomena. We have oftentimes media blackouts for spectacular things like this. I don't think this was ever shown in the year 2000 in any mainstream media in America. But this is all over the place in, in, in France and England. They didn't have any bias. But as soon as they found out that this text was in English, they dropped it. But Roswell's in America. And we speak English here primarily, so I can see what's going on. But it's interesting. In my grade school geometry class, I remember something like this. It was because it was the function of pi. It was a geometric uh, representation of the function of pi. And pi is really a simple thing. It's a wonderful number, 3.14159265. I'm proud because I memorized it to the eighth decimal point. But anyway, you got this line here, which, which is actually bisecting the circle. Now, if you know the distance here, you multiply that times pi, and you get the circumference. Or if you know the circumference, but not the diameter, you divide pi by this, and you'll get this. So it's a wonderful number. You can actually find the area of the circle also, but I won't get into that. What it looks like is this alien is saying, this watcher is saying, why don't you solve for pi? Well, I already knew this was 100 feet long. So the result would be just move the decimal places over to the right, you know, two spaces, you know, 314 feet, 0.15 feet then, the, cir the circumference. But that's not the integers that we're using. It's not the, the, the actual measuring system that we're using. There's 33 lines along here. So what happens then if you would multiply 33 with pi? In fact, I started thinking maybe it was referring to the cross site at Roswell because all these other uh, equations pointed to Roswell so eloquently. So I actually multiplied pi times 33.33. And you can see 33.33 here is a crash site latitude. And what you get is the crash site longitude. Now this is in decimal. There's uh, two different ways of measuring latitude and longitude. One is with arc minutes and seconds, and one is with decimal like this is. But the coordinates are so exact that when I plug this into my map uh, uh 
location finder, I actually ended up within a 50 mile radius of almost all the major crash site, at least, at least the legendary areas, the, the traditional areas of the crash site for uh, the 1947 event. There is the city of Roswell. You are here. In fact, this whole idea of Roswell's latitude dividing into its longitude equaling pi is one of the main reasons why the Roswell event happened in this location. I've heard a lot of conjecture over why the crash ended up here. Um, accident, uh, our nuclear technology, perhaps our radar station, something that no one really knows because it was top secret and hasn't been released yet. It's all part of a bigger plan. It's a part of a plan to educate mankind. And these guys have been around for a long time, the watchers. It's so accurate, in fact, that if you are to calculate the latitude and longitude divided into each other, you can actually draw out pi lines, which almost look like aircraft flight paths. And I was very curious about this. I had my brother actually go to his, his uh, map program and plot these lines, and he ended up getting this configuration. And the reason is 33.33 through here. If you're measuring in arc seconds, they end at 60 degrees, so you're going to have to jump to do the next calculation. So there's only two lines to that long. This one represents the digital line. This is a 33.33 line. And this is a, uh, uh, a map of the traditional crash sites. There have been speculation over which ones are authentic and which ones aren't. And this is no, by no means a real uh, accurate map. But the general placement of these things is here. And this is the site, the area that I want to focus on, because this is where the pie lines actually occur. In fact, they do occur on the pie lines. These are the traditional sites for the, uh, the Brazil Ranch site, the second Brazil Ranch site, the Jim Ragsdale site, and this thing, the Hub Corn site, which I don't know much about. And I wasn't really that uh, studied on the Roswell event until I started finding these things out from this crop circle. So I looked really quickly at some of Stanton Friedman's work and others, and I found that there was a commanding officer of the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, not exactly at the time of the, uh, the Roswell event, but he was working there at that time, and later he became the commanding officer of the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And he was able to say that there were two distinct, distinct crash sites, even though they happened at the same time. And there's some other even more symbolic, deeper meanings to all these things that are incorporated into the, the crop circle. For example, even the word ASCII. There's actually a Greek word, ASCII, which means without shadow. And I ended up finding this out because I would do searches in Google, and then ASCII in Greek would come out, and it would say without shadow. And I thought, well, that's peculiar because that's exactly how Eratosthenes in 292 BC measured the circumference of the Earth. And then after measuring the circumference of the Earth, he was able to solve the diameter of the Earth using pi, which has shades of what this crop circle does. But the legend has it that he looked down a well in Syene, which is below the Tropic of Cancer, below the Tropic of the Crab, and it was a crab wood glyph. Sounds like I'm reaching, but I'm not. In this place called Syene, the Syene Well. And Syene is renowned for its production of rose granite. In fact, this granite is so famous, it's been put into the pyramids in, in Giza. And uh, rock cutters in Europe refer to this granite as rose granite. And in the solstice, the sun will shine perfectly down this well, or any well in Syene at the time, and cast no shadow, ASCII. So basically, you're looking down a rose well, which Eratosthenes did. 
so that he could measure the earth. It's about learning geometry, measuring the earth. That's what geometry means. Now, if you look at this message then, with respect to the Roswell incident, it takes on more significance. You don't see this vagueness and ambiguity here because if, in fact, Philip Corso's book is correct, and he's talking about crash material being inserted into the private sector, what have we seen from that? And when we have our officials telling us, oh, Project Mogul, they dropped some dummies, and you guys are dummies for believing, you know, I don't believe it because there's just too much going on here. There's too much going on in the, in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual sort of sense. And that's what my website was about to begin with. I was talking about how we're not just commanding every step in our lives. Our futures are not designed around our own intentions. Not entirely. There's a hierarchy out there, and they exist, and they are guiding us towards a conclusion. Now, I thought it was interesting. These two, these two symbols represent dimensions, dimensionless constants. And these are things that Richard Hoagland and Earl Torrin had worked out in 1988 when it came to how can you determine if there is some intelligent life on another planet if you find some structures. You won't know what measuring system they're using. But these are independent of measuring systems. They're dimensionless constants. That means that if you're measuring a circle and saying there's 600 degrees in it, not 360 degrees, this will still apply. You'll still be able to find this angle and ratios that he was talking about. If you can actually divide the surface area of this, pen, this tetrahedron into the surface area of the sphere, you'll get this number. It doesn't have anything to do with how you're measuring a circle. And this. That number works with any system, like I was demonstrating with 33.33. You'll end up with a number that will make sense regardless. And that is a strange but a very testable connection between Mars, the Cydonia region that Holden's done all this work on, and Earl Torin, I might add, and this unexpected information from this crop circle in Winchester, England, and Roswell. The tetrahedral signature 19.47 and pi. There's also another number that comes up, of course, and this is 33. And if you notice, the, the Cydonia site is actually at an angle here from the east, from two north, at an angle of 33.33. And I got this from Mark Carlotto's site. It was he who had discovered this principle. It is integral to understanding what's going on with the watchers, what's going on with the crop circle, what's going on with Roswell. This, you go to a site the FBI has for the Freedom of Information Act, and notice the strange occurrence of the number three in this, in this memorandum, dated 1950, March 29th. It says an investigator for the Air Force stated that three so-called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. Right there. This is the crop, the crop glyph from Winchester. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers, exactly like depicted there. They are 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall. And then it goes on, and uh, they are speculating about what the suits were for, that these things were wearing it. I started wondering, why does this recur? Why did the bodies have to be three feet tall? Why were there three of them? Why were the three uh, discs recovered? If, that's, if this is a bona fide document, it's still actually following what this crop circle has suggested. And this leads me to uh, a very a very fascinating and sometimes difficult to grasp connection between Mars and Earth. But I, I think you'll see where I'm going with this. This is a 33.33 line, which kind of divides the 
sites that you can actually see here at Roswell. If you're going to go to the east, you'll actually end up at a place that has a signature of 33.33 so strongly on it that it stands out almost independently from any other place on our planet. That's called Sidon. And our journey across to the east, we go to Atlantic here, where Plato had actually said, across from the Pillars of Hercules, Atlantis would have existed right there at 33 and 33. But nothing does right now, unless you have, can go under the ocean with uh, some radar equipment, you might find something, I don't know. But here, this is a place where you end up, which has some stu substance to it still. It's ancient Sidonia. It's a counterpart of a place called Sidonia on Mars, where the most convincing artificial structures that have ever been discovered anywhere besides on Earth exist. And the 33.33 line goes perfectly through Sidon, which is the capital city of ancient Sidonia. And it was alternately called Canaan. And the, and the quick explanation for that is Canaan was a son of Ham, who was a son of Noah, but Sidon was the son of Canaan, the first son of Canaan. So you have three generations removed from Noah. What's all this about 33 and the third? I thought about it for a while, and I thought, why don't I just come out and say it? Revelation gives a really clear understanding, and Revelation is so maligned when it comes to the secular uh, you know, historian, um, and even in theology, people stay away from it quite a bit because it's so symbolic. It's hard to look at it with any uh, empiricism, be able to pin anything down and say, well, this is what this means. But I'll throw this out because you can figure out what it means pretty obviously. It's talking about the great red dragon, which the majority of theologians, I'd say 99.5% of them would say, well, it must represent Satan, at least in the Christian paradigm. And his tail draws, power, draws a third part of the stars of heaven. Well, that's not 33 exactly, but a third of anything, 100% of anything is actually, if you take your calculator out, 33.33333333. I'll just go all the way to the end, the end of your readout. Third of anything is 33.3. And dragon is from the Greek drakine or drakomai, which means to look at, on, describe, perceive, or watch. Notice the very peculiar reptilian look to the eye now that you're actually thinking about it in that framework. Well, here's the story. If we're talking about watchers intersecting with our Earth in some place on the 33rd line here. The most notorious, most famous story of that sort of intervention in antiquity is this idea of the flood epic. What starts the whole problem? In Genesis 6, it talks about how the B'nai Ha'elohim, the sons of God, had come down to the Earth because they saw these women who were human and decided to make wives of them and procreate. Now, there's a, quite a bit of information out there from antiquity that talks about this event, but the one I like to use the best is from the Book of Enoch. And it says, When the sons of men had multiplied in those days, beautiful and comely daughters were born to them, and the watchers, sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, Come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men, and let us beget ourselves children. And they descended onto the peak of Mount Hermon, which is right there in the land of Sidonia. And this is their capital city. And you actually notice that there's actually four 33-3 nodes here. You have latitude and longitude that are 33 and 33. And these both fall in the ocean in the southern hemisphere. This one falls in the ocean here in the northern hemisphere. The only one that has a mountain anywhere near to it and exactly on the parallel is Mount Hermon. The only one. Well, <clears throat> I'll jump 
through a huge amount of information and time, but the next thing that happens after these watchers come, they create Nephilim, giants. And Dr. Heiser was talking about this yesterday night, and that is true. The watchers have a distinct place, separate from the Nephilim. They're, they're, they're parents, but they don't exist with them. They kind of commune with them, and they did. But the Nephilim, the giants, stayed on the earth, and they corrupted everything. So this is also from the Book of Enoch. Then said the Most High, go to Noah and tell him that a deluge is about to come upon the whole earth. And it is coming to heal the earth which the angels have corrupted, that all the children of men may not perish through all the secret things that the watchers have disclosed. First Enoch, section 1, chapter 10. You go check that out. It actually sometimes will use angels of heaven in place of watchers, but it's an Ethiopic and... I don't have the expertise to go back and parse out what exactly it's saying. This is just a translation that has actually used Watcher in it. And I've seen it many times because it isn't just in the Book of Enoch, it's in other uh, cultures as well as they talk about those who watch humanity. Anyway, the flood came. Noah ended up here. He cursed his son Ham indirectly, cursing his first son Canaan. Canaan migrated to here the land of Canaan, and his first son was Sidon. And they called this place Sidonia because Canaan has actually, in Hebrew, uh, a derogatory word. It means lowly one. It means dog. In fact, our word canine comes from Canaan, if you check out the etymology far, far enough back in history. So this is Sidonia. And a lot of Greeks had... A lot of Greek historians have a lot to say about this because they inherited their knowledge from this area. Nonus and Dionysica says, from the beginning of time, people lived there, people of divine progeny, and divine progeny is born of godlike beings, born of heaven. Their age is that of the universe. Well, that's a direct description of what I just said, and Enoch just explains here. This is where it all happened. This is where these angels came down. This is where the watchers came down and started their program of breeding with women, human women. So did they leave a legacy? Is there anything here that's remarkable that might say something about why the Greeks would say this is the oldest place on earth, that Sidon and Sidonia was the actual birthplace of knowledge on our planet? There is. And if you go on the 36th parallel, 36 is a really symbolic number, too. It's the actual number of degrees in the edge of a pentagram. Every single little point is 36 degrees. Go to a place called Baalbek. And you'll see something like this. It was only uncovered oh, towards the first part of the last century. There was detritus and Pleistocene alluvials covering it almost to this halfway mark. Now, Pleistocene alluvials are rock and matter that have been placed there with the agency of water. And you can't be a Pleistocene alluvial unless you're over 13,000 years old. But that's what the geologists actually classify all this overburden here. And you can see, there's this little guy standing by this huge block of rock, which is still fixed to the bedrock underneath. It's 72 feet long, 14 feet high, and it weighs an estimated 1,720 tons. Also, you can see the extreme weathering on these little facets here. This is actually a quarry that the thing's in. Here's a more modern picture. Uh, Lebanon's very proud of this artifact. They excavated this whole area here, and you can see the extreme weathering on these things. These aren't these aren't 4,000 years old. These aren't even 6,000 or before even writing old. These are at the Pleistocene age. The Pleistocene is marked by a global die-off. If you're a paleontologist, you understand that the marks in geology actually are uh, array, uh, originating around die-offs, global die-offs. And Geologists will agree that the Pleistocene age ended about 10,500 B. 
BC or 13,000 years ago. This is part of what's called the Baalbek Trilithon. There's a little guy in it with a fez re regarding this huge edifice. It's actually a foundation for a huge complex above it. And you can see there's little edges here broken off that somebody had actually come back to this site after it had been destroyed, if it indeed had actually been built intact, and put these extra stones here and try to actually rebuild it again. But these things are about a level of two-story house at the top. And they are a little bit lighter, about 1,200 tons. And here's a wider picture of the Trilithon. And these are two guys standing above it. Its, it's enormity is, is stupefying. If you actually get a chance to go here, which you probably wouldn't because of Hezbollah, I have a uh, big training camp right here now. But if you could actually go here, you couldn't comprehend it. It is such a large structure. And then above it, you see this incumbent masonry and then another change above that. And archaeologists want to say that the Romans did it all. But you can see that there's three different styles, at least in the face here. You can see Roman architecture here. And then you can see that are Hellenistic Greek. And then you have the Canaanitic, the, the Sidonian here. And then who knows who built this. The legends have it that Cain, the first son of Adam and Eve, built it in a fit of raving madness. But that's the legend there. Now from this area called Sidonia, the knowledge was brought out into Europe by Europa. And really, she's an important person because she's a princess of Sidonia in the Greek myth. And most people don't realize that her name is why we call Europe Europe. But the story goes that she was abducted from the coast of Sidonia, which is now Lebanon, and she was brought to Crete. And if you go to Crete, you can find all these effigies of women with these big eyes. And you wonder what that's all about. Well, Euro Europa actually means wide eyes or being able to see really, really well. And interestingly enough, Apis and Apa have a, a common etymology. They are snake and eyes. This is actually an effigy from Crete. Here, a woman with her eyes open as wide as she can have them. And there's eyes on her little crown here. And an owl, which sees really well, in the dark even, and snakes. She's always referred to as a priestess of Crete. Well, Europa, in the myth, came to Crete. She brought this knowledge from Sidonia to Crete. And here, this is a Roman carving of Demeter. Notice the same attitude of the uh, arms and the snakes in the arms. There's definitely some illuminated connections here. And this would be the origin, biblically the first transfer of heavenly knowledge to a human being by a watcher, which is he, who's also a serpent, interestingly enough. The serpent said to the woman, you should surely not die, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, this fruit of knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened, Europa, in Greek, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And though Satan was in the guise of a serpent here, being subtle, he is an angel from above, from the heavens. That's a transfer of heavenly knowledge to man on the earth. An amazing coincidence. If you look at all these uh, Renaissance paintings of that actual transfer, you'll notice that there's a commonality between this fruit. And that's because when these were painted, there was no such thing as a golden apple. There was no such cultivar in existence. The only golden apple in existence which had been uh, uh, understood by the Illuminati, those who knew this understanding of the history of where knowledge came from and where it was going, would always paint it in the same way because it was supposed to be a quince. And a quince has a scientific name, Pyrus Sidonia, the fruit of the heavens. 
And for all you uh, UFO aficionados, a zeta reticuli, a gray, another word for a gray, actually repeating this motif, this is a Greek letter zeta, and in, in astronomy, the telescope has a reticulum. In other words, a reticle uh, is just a crosshairs in your telescope that you sight a star on. It's interesting that the abductees would say, and even Chandler's would say, well, these, uh, these grays call themselves zeta reticulans. They must come from the zeta reticulan system. I submit that they're using this symbology cryptically, inserting these ideas into our subconscious mind, even subconscious culture. We're almost unaware of the fact that these things repeat themselves in a way that's kind of strange to me because I'm thinking, why would they want to tell us who they are? Because we, we have a dossier on them. We know what's going on with their past. The world, according to what the Bible says, was destroyed because of their meddling with humanity. Why would they have to continue to use these symbols over and over again? And I submit that it has something to do with the law, the, things, the way things work, a hierarchical law. They were made to... Uh, display things. They're angels. In, in, in Hebrew, that's malak. It means to just uh, be a messenger. In Greek, angelos is just messenger. They would give a message from high places to lower places or go between, you know, from one, one point to the other. They're designed to do this in this one way and this one way only. They can't avoid doing the symbolic things that they do any more than we can avoid following the law of gravity. Now, the knowledge of geometry has always been, at least from farthest antiquity, a sacred science. Not just sacred geometry. There's no, there's no distinction as you go farther back in time. It's all sacred. And Plato was even able to say that geometry rightly treated as the knowledge of the eternal. And why would he say something like that if, if he just got really smart when you know, we were able to make really good circles and build really straight houses? I don't think it has anything to do with eternity. But it does if you look at it from the idea that it was given from above. And a real good geometry, uh, someone studying geometry will, will understand that. The illuminated fraternities who put such a huge emphasis on geometry understand its origin. That's, that's the major message of geometry to them. And here's how it works. This is how the heavens are even now anchored to the earth. And our first clue is right here in Sidonia, ancient Sidonia, also called Canaan, now called Lebanon, Beirut, a little part of Israel here. It was an actual big place, but it centers around this mountain here where the first uh, descent of angels came to corrupt mankind with their secret knowledge, according to Enoch. Hermon is called Syrian by the Sidonians. And then if you look at the name Canaan, in Greek, kunon, dog, Canaan, rule. Interesting connection. Latin, canis, caninus, canis, dog, of course. Cana, read. Canon, law, measurement. It seems like a system of measuring something, a, a dynamic standard connected to this lowly guy named Canaan. And this is the key. Canis Major, Sirius, the dog star. Now, the reason this is an important star is because in the northern hemisphere, the northern celestial hemisphere, this star is the brightest. There's no other star brighter than this. Now, it's interesting, too, that this symbol here to the Egyptians represented Sirius, and especially this little five pointed, kind of starfishy looking star. You could say it's a pentagram, pentagon sort of thing. It's got five points, a little bit off, but it looks almost anthropomorphic. It always has five points. This is Isis. And Didorus Siculus says, and he's explaining Isis here, I am she who rises in the star that is in the constellation of the dog. And that connects this symbol with the idea that it rises, that this, this deity that's been renowned as a wisdom deity as an agrarian teacher uh, in Egyptian cosmology, a teacher of how to be civilized, of how to do civilization things, how to read, write, uh, uh, make 
cities, do all the things that she needed to do to become civilized. They came from her. Now you go to Mars. And on Cydonia, Mars, and remember Cydonia is just the sun, Sidon is just the sun of Canaan. You see the Canaan star again, the biggest edifice ever seen anywhere in this solar system. This thing's almost two miles wide. It's about 1,500 feet tall. And you can see the resemblance here, the star of Sirius. And this shows you how far back this pentagram idea goes back to the cuneiform from 3500 BC from Sumer. And another interesting thing about Cydonia on Mars, look where it's located. Prime meridian, zero, where you measure everything from. The standard, Cydonia can be also Canaan. This is where you measure Mars from, at least east and west. And lo and behold, the actual city complex that Hoagland has been talking about for so long, the place where 19.47 seems to show up over and over again, the place that seems to have intelligent design, it's located right on the zero meridian. Now, how did that happen? Schiaparelli, back in the 17, uh, 1870s, was studying Mars. That prime meridian had already been set up. He was the guy that set this nomenclature over the top of it. He did this deliberately. He was steeped in the occult. You can look up history of him and, and biographies of him, and you'll find that he was uh, also collaborating with Camille Flammarion and Percival Lowell. You go to seances, they would study the supernatural. And when Schiaparelli's eyesight gave out, due to studying Mars so much through his telescope, and they weren't very good in his day, and mapping it. All these surface features are still used today. He wrote a book, a compendium on astronomy in the Old Testament. This is a celestial map from Ptolemy. You'll notice that he has put the prime meridian of this map, this is the entirety of it, right through this dog. Because that dog is actually where Sirius exists. He knows where to put the prime meridian of the celestial globe. Uh, astrologers especially will put the prime meridian of the celestial globe at the first degree of Aries, only because of the precession of the equinoxes, and I'll get into that later. It makes way more sense to put it right here where the brightest star is. That's how the ancient mariners understood the heavens to work. And if you look at it a little bit closer, you'll actually realize that out of the Zodiac, the 12, the 12 symbols that we see on our ecliptic, the only 12 that the sun travels through as it goes, uh, or the earth travels as it goes around the sun, and we sight the sun through every year through all these symbols, the 12 signs of the Zodiac, Sirius belongs to Gemini. So this is where the prime meridian of the heavens will run, right through Gemini, right through the twins, and right through Sirius, according to Ptolemy, at least. Then here's the Gemini, Castor and Pollux, and where the prime meridian would run, if you're looking at them. And this is something that I find astounding. During the 4th of July, the sun actually rises on that prime meridian. And only on the 4th of July, from only this latitude, 33.33, you can actually have the sun rise to exactly 19.47 degrees, and Sirius will be perfectly on the horizon. Is that why this date is so important? It's a rhetorical question, I think so. OK, this is just so you believe me. This is a program that I have. You can get them off the internet for a song, but here it is, Sirius on the horizon, and the sun at 19.47 degrees the stamp of tetrahedral geometry, right in Gemini, right there. And then, of course, there's the altitude again. 90.5 is uh, a round number of 94.47. I can't really get it to anything more narrow than that. And then, of course, Roswell, New Mexico, 33.33. Now, Roswell actually lies on 33.2, but this is where the craft site is, and I can actually adjust it with my program. 
And the actual glyph for Gemini, the shorthand glyph in astrology is pillars. This is Gemini. And that is significant because now we actually can find out how the heavens, if the primary meaning of the heavens is where Gemini is and Sirius, the pillars then connect the heavens to the earth in some way. And the Greeks explain it. In Homer's Odyssey, he says the At Atlas, who was a titan, the magician, knows the depths of all the seas, and he, no other, guards the tall pillars that keep the sky and the earth apart. And he uses the word pillars here, not pillar. Amazingly, the myth goes that Atlas was holding up the sky, and Perseus came and held the head of Medusa up to him because he wouldn't let him, him pass and uh, turned him into mountains. And you actually notice that the only Atlas mountains on our planet are perfectly on our zero meridian. And this is borne out here by some Greek uh, lyric, a fragment from the Etymologicum Magnum. I love saying that. And here it is. This is how the heavens and the earth are connected. This is what the watchers are trying to tell us. For some very specific reason, the Prime Meridian, the Atlas Mountains, the mythical Atlas holding the pillars, which are Gemini. Or Sirius is the brightest star. It's just fairly logical. Brightest star, Prime Meridian. Where heaven and earth meet, where time and space are measured. Even Albert Magnus, which is, he is highly venerated in Catholic circles, said, that all the powers of things below originate in the stars and constellations of the heavens. He's, he's been canonized, actually. He was canonized in like 64 or something, kind of late. Um, and here he's studying something here called the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. This is where this comes from. This is a highly occult sort of study he was doing, but he did it under this idea of uh, uh, science. It's a broad, general way of getting away with studying the occult back then. Uh, and he says the stars and constellations of the heavens are where these things originate, this, this power from heaven in some way. And all these powers are poured down into the things below by the first circle of the constellations, like I was talking about, the 12 of the zodiac, where we sight the sun. It's called the ecliptic. All the planets move along here. The sun moves along here. The orbit of the planets then are on this plane. So if you take the constellations then, of uh, the, the signs of the zodiac and lay them according to where the prime meridian will anchor them here, Castor and Pollux at the twins, the pillars. This is how the rest of them look. This is how they're all arranged on the earth in this metaphorical, symbolic way. And this is a circular view of it. Here again, the pillars, Gemini, the star Sirius down here, the heaven earth map. And this little ticket you can get if you go to the Royal Astronomy in Greenwich. And it says, I thought uh, significantly, the center of time and space. Well, a being that has mastery over time and space is considered a deity, at least in antiquity. And here you have the primary reading going through Greenwich here, going through England. And there's a location of that crop circle that I started out with. I'll try it outside of Winchester. 4,983 miles to Roswell. So if you place Gemini, like the, the uh, prime meridian of heavens is originating with Sirius, in this manner, you end up with the pillars, Gemini, and the dog in this sort of configuration. And lo and behold, These are exactly the same symbols that show up in Roman cosmology. You have the idea that they're founding myth of these twins starting Rome, building Rome. And what they're actually saying here then is this is a, this is a, a uh, religion of the cosmos. This is a religion that was given to them. They're trying to encrypt this information so that it could be understood by those who actually can read the symbols. This is how heaven connects to the earth. But what they're also saying is, these guys are from Mars, because their father was Mars. That connects Mars again in some way with this heavenly knowledge. And here you have Canaan, the canine, 
and you have the milk of knowledge feeding these guys, the uh, progenitors of Roman culture in myth. Well, I thought it was interesting that if you looked at the crop circle when it was made in August 14th, 2002, that those same motifs, Sirius, which would be the dog star, Mars, and the sun, all showed up on the horizon exactly at the same time. In fact, the sun and Mars were in a cult. They were actually conjuncting. And all these, these three bodies were rising on the horizon exactly at the same time from the latitude of where this crop circle was made at the time it was made. You might think that these are two coins from Rome, you know, the Capitolian wolf and Romulus and Remus, but they're not. They're separated by almost a thousand years. This one is from Rome. This one is from Crete. You can see this, this one guy suckling from a wolf or a dog. But underneath you can see here the word Kaidon, a corruption of the name Sidon, Kappa, Iota, Delta, read that. Down here it says Roma. This is from Crete and that's the reason it's from Crete is because there's actually a Sidonia on Crete and right here at the base of Mount Lucia which is actually the mountain of the wolf. So when Europa was abducted all this symbolic understanding of how the heavens were, were measured and the earth were measured and how it's connected to the earth. All that was given here in this mystery religion. That's where we get the idea of gnosis, meaning knowledge. There's gnosis. It all came from here via Europa and then finally up into the Greek culture. Now, in this heaven-earth matching system, this mirror of how heaven and earth are related, when you talk about the constellations anchored over that, this is from Crete's myth of Theseus dispatching the Minotaur. That looks an awful lot like Orion's placement next to Taurus. And that isn't without precedent because Taurus actually does exist in a 30 degree swath over this whole area, starting about Greece here, all over Crete, Sidonia, all the way out to this line. And that also explains why we have so much myth about Romulus and Remus, the twins, and the dog, because there's Rome right there, right on the edge. Rome is on the Tiber. The Tiber in Latin means the divider. And in fact, the Milky Way divides the zodiac in half. Six on each side, right through there, right at their feet, and goes right up through there. And you have underneath Taurus, the Taurus Mountains in Turkey. I couldn't make this stuff up. It's just... And here you have Hathor, the cow-headed woman. You can also have Apis, the cow-headed man. It's just a version of Orion, this man, and Taurus, commemor commemorating a position under heavens. Here's Virgo. And the point of this is to get the idea that she's usually depicted with wings. She's a heavenly uh, symbol. She's got a branch in one hand and a sheaf of grain in the other. Here's another picture, same sort of configuration with wings. And look where Virgo lives. This is where she's oriented over the, he over the earth, in the heavens. Right over America. Perfectly. Right here. If you'd actually look at where the center part of that would be, and she's pointing to it. This is from a grimoire, illuminated, of course. Or she's pointing to her place on the earth. We commemorate this. This is the center of where Virgo would actually be if you looked at uh, the 30 degree swath that she occupies on, on the earth. Here's our capital, right, wedged between Virginia and Maryland. These aren't names that are coming out of the hat. These are, are actually commemorating this. There are illuminated folks involved with the placement of this thing. Zon Font, the guy who put this thing together, has demonstrated this sacred geometry, if you want to call it that, through the complex of Washington, D.C. over and over and over again. And look at this. Where we have our most influence and power in our country, the most powerful country, a lot of people want to argue about 
ever. I don't think so. But at least now we're pretty powerful. I mean, split the atom and all. Um, this is where we house all our war-making factions. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, all in here. And then you look on Mars, the largest, largest artificial structure on Mars, the symbol of the canine star, the Sidonian star, on the planet of the war god. Uh, how, can you, how can you not see the connection? Uh, continuing, it gets really, it gets really in depth about how the ancients have actually commemorated how the heavens are placed over their countries. And here's Virgo over the Earth, and there's Mexico, and this is Hydra, Corvus pecking him. This is Mexico. You'd think that there'd be something there that would commemorate this idea, and, and you have it. It's their national symbol. Of course, they're using indigenous animals here. This is a hawk instead of a crow and, a, and a, a rattlesnake, which is a reptile that is there. It's, about, it's a lot more popular there, but if you actually look at some other things about Mexico, there's actually some very Martian things happening there too. It was said that the Aztec were told to move from an area up here down to this latitude, 1947, by their war god, Hewitt Zinopatli. And he said to just set up camp here Whenever you see that symbol of a snake in the talons of a hawk on a cactus. And so they searched for that sign until they found it. And it was right here in the middle of a swamp. And so they set to build their new nice city in the middle of this mosquito infested swamp. And it took a long time. But why? They called themselves the Chichimec, the sons of the dog. You know, so you're seeing these things repeated again. Even across a whole ocean, you actually have this idea of the dog, Mars, measuring the Earth, repeating the symbols. I think this is an incredible picture. This is a bilateral symmetry face. We have actually on this side a lion. It's kind of hard to see. I couldn't get a full on frontal view. And this side's a human. And the archaeologists who found this in Texaco, uh, Tabasco, Mexico, have said that it actually is depicting uh, the lion human cult, and this is a person in the act of transforming. But you notice the attitude of the face here looking out into the, the, into the heavens. It was the Olmec who supposedly carved this thing. And here we have the face on Mars. Notice the strange similarity here between the features that NASA would have you dismiss completely out of hand. I've gone to trouble to actually highlight just exactly how integral the lion eye here and the nose are incorporated into this ancient feature, which I believe has every hallmark of an artificial structure. This, of course, is almost two, two miles wide by almost a mile, two miles long by a mile wide. If you continue down to South America, you find Leo dominates the country. And if you go to this, this little city here, Cusco in Peru, you'll find amazing artifacts. This is a megalithic site called Saxahuman. This woman's standing here in front of one of these great walls that were excavated oh, maybe only about 150 years ago. But right through here are stones that weigh in the 150 ton range. And there's a big enough one here to actually have been estimated, estimated at over 300 tons. What she's actually standing in front of is one tooth. Here are the rest of the teeth in a big, a big jaw of a giant lion that the whole city of Cusco, Peru was built over or into. Here it's a little bit degraded with modern convention, but it's the mouth here with the teeth that you were just looking at. Commemorating, commemorating the lion above them. If you go to Bolivia, which is about oh, a little bit over 100 miles to the east, you'll find a place called Puma Punku here. This is on top of a place called the Antiplano. It is the Altiplano. It is actually about 13,000 feet above sea level. That's almost, that's more than two miles high. The archaeologists who look at this thing say it was built in 200 AD. 
which is pretty difficult to explain when you talk about megaliths here that weigh up to 440 tons that were transported from a 10 mile away quarry. And they're hewn in andesite, which is incredibly hard. And this is supposedly a dock, a port for ships, even though it's a at the altitude of 13,000 feet above sea level right now. It's actually 15 miles away from Lake Titicaca, which uh, name means Lion Cliff, Titicaca does. So you have the Puma Gate and the Lion Cliff in the same area, in an area where no one could grow anything because it's too high, and that supposedly held ships and docks. Here's a picture of the shattered remains of Puma Punku. This is the megalith that weighs around 400 tons. They're shattered and jumbled together like uh, tinker toys. And this has all been uncovered just recently. These are some of the newer excavations. They don't have enough money to really take the overburden off the top of it. But again, a geologist will tell you these are Pleistocene alluvials. And they're not just plain Pleistocene alluvials, they're called marine Pleistocenes, which means they were deposited by salt water. So what you have to ask yourself then is, what are alluvials doing here from the Pleistocene? Because the Pleistocene ended 13,000 years ago. And this looks like some of the most intricate stone laying. I mean, if you look at these pieces of work here, they're hundreds of tons. You can't even insert a knife blade between many of these. They're set with such precision that they're dug down into the bedrock and then multi-facets multi so that they don't jar loose. What's that doing under waterborne detritus? It's because it's just like Enoch says. There was a global flood. In fact, the people, the Indians of that area, actually were able to get into detail about it. They said that a massive body came close to the earth and that it pulled a tidal bulge uh, of the oceans out with it because the earth captured this body like a, a moon or a comet in its, in its gravity. And as this or orbit decayed, it reached its roche limit and fragmented and this huge wall of water, this huge mound that was moving along with this moon was dissipated and it flowed back towards the poles each direction and it wiped out their civilization in one night. And that's their legend. Now the watchers, those who've been abducted by the watchers, many times come back with this idea that the watchers are saying the earth's going to be destroyed again. Well, they should know. Enoch says that they're the reason the earth was uh, destroyed already. But it's interesting that this would be a revelation to those who've been studying Bible prophecy because when the Messiah comes back, that eschatology talks about disasters unlike men have ever existed through are coming. So it's a no-brainer. But the reason they say this is because they want to convey why all this hoopla about connecting the heavens to the earth. Why are they doing this in this way? What they're trying to tell us with the placement of these megalithic sites they're talking about procession. They're talking about a clock, a cosmic clock, that talks about when the chaos, the destruction, the global decimation will happen again. It's a clock that they're trying to explain to us. They not only have to show us the clock, they have to explain how it works. And this explains it. These megalithic sites have been placed in a configuration around the Earth in the manner of a pentagram. Why? If you look at a, a Cydonia fruit, I cut it in half, this fruit that symbolizes knowledge from heaven, it's also pentagonal. In fact, Pythagoras used to, um, and he's considered the father of uh, many illuminated fraternities, he used to hand his, his new uh, student uh, apple and a knife. And if the student was worthy of being taught by him, he would cut it along the equator instead of along its axis. It would reveal a perfect pentagram inside. And the secret then that he just revealed 
would be the secret of precession. The precession of the equinox is a uh, ill-understood function of the heavens, but it's integral to understanding how this heaven to earth knowledge works and what the watchers are trying to tell us. They're trying to get the scoop on the idea that there's going to be a cataclysm coming. They want to be able to tell mankind with this knowledge from heaven, we're in charge. We're your progenitors. We're the guys who are in control of this earth. We have been before. We're going to warn you through these various means. They're kind of doing this uh, distraction technique, which is interesting, but here you have the equations, real simple, 72 degrees between each one of these points. And in the 360 degree circle, a system where you measure a circle by 360, you end up with the exact number it takes to go through one cycle of the procession. That is, every year, the sun will rise just a little bit farther along the signs of the zodiac, the 12. It takes 72 years to move one degree. So 360 degrees times 72, you get 25,920 years. Well, that's, that's like the first hand of the clock, the, the, the hour hand, say. It's the major hand, it's the slow hand of the clock that they're talking about, the great, the great celestial clock of doom. You can actually see this processional number incorporated into the latitude of the crop glyph, the crab of crop glyph, in 1947. There is exactly 2,160 miles between these two latitudes as a crow flies, even over the curvature of the Earth. That's how exact it gets. 2,160 is exactly the number of years it takes to move through one sign of the zodiac. Just for the heck of it, I decided to divide that number by pi because it seemed to be something that the, that the crop circle the watchers were showing. And lo and behold, the number you get is exactly the number of days in a Martian year. This is connected to the Earth, though. We're talking about how many solar days in the Earth it would take to equal a Martian year. And then in addition, I didn't put this up because it wasn't quite as significant. If you subtract 333 from that, you get exactly the number of days in a lunar year. Okay, well, in addition to this idea of procession of the equinoxes, there are four cardinal points to the ecliptic. Here's the 12 signs of the zodiac that are aligned on here, but there are four cardinal points as the stars, the brightest ones on the ecliptic, are in these constellations, Leo, Aphicus, Ophiuchus, Aquarius, and Taurus. And that is a signature of a cherubim. Now this is a symbol that many uh, uh, who study history will realize have been around for a long time. And they're a huge part of a, an insight or a symbol for the angelic beings in, in the Old Testament. They had four faces, Ezekiel talks about. Well, there's four cardinal points to the ecliptic. If you combine them all together, you get this unique little animal here. And this one is an ivory from, uh, it escapes me, but there's a head here, a uh, human head, four paws of a lion, eagle wings in the back part, supposedly of a bull. The bull tail is up instead of down, so they, they believe that it's a bull. It has all the hallmark and stamp of an angelic being, which seems almost like a paradox. If the watchers are angels, but angels are in the Bible as being good guys, you know, what's the difference? Well, there are moral alignments with angels. There are those who have decided they will do what God wants. There's those who have actually been corrupted along with the greatest angel, the greatest cherub, whoever was in existence, existence, who was corrupted by his own beauty. And now we have this interesting sort of moral conflict going on, and you see the motifs of this. It's the center of the Ark of the, the, uh, the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was held, the very most holy object that the Hebrews had. These guys are guarding it. The same symbols are on the top of the ark. It's all about something to do with this conflict. The heavens, the angels, humanity. 
on a side note, the guy who built all this stuff in Solomon's temple was from Sidonia. Hiram of Tyre, he was the king of Sidonia. He didn't call himself king of Tyre, he called himself the king of the whole country. And you actually look in the Bible and you can find Sidonia as being the name that they would use. It was also known as Phoenicia by the Greeks, but that's kind of a derogatory term too because Phoenicia just means red men. The red men came from there. And there's conjecture over it was maybe they, the dye industry dyed these guys who when they would go and trade with the Greeks, they'd have all this purple dye on their hands and stuff. But I think it has a lot more to do with the idea that Mars was part of their culture. Mars, their red planet. And even the face on Mars has some precedent in the Bible. It's in Ezekiel 41, 18 and 19. The panels of the holy place, and this is talking about a temple that doesn't exist yet in Jerusalem, were made with cherubims and palm trees. So the palm tree was between cherub and a cherub, and every cherub had two faces. So that the face of a man was towards a palm tree from one side, and the face of a young lion toward the palm tree on the other side. It was made throughout the house. And that's exactly what we have here. According to the research that Holden's been doing, and according to this precedent that's been set out, uh, defining cherubs, defining what's going on on Mars, Holden told me that it was a very strange thing I had, this idea that there's angelic civilization somewhere, or that they existed, that they ever manipulate anything into a structure. But the Bible actually says that's exactly what they did. In fact, they taught men civilization. They were the ones that caused humanity to build their greatest edifices. That's just basic. Now, this would be the second part of the great cosmological clock, the great uh, chronog the great clock of doom in the heavens. This, this word in Hebrew, Leviathan. This is a, a talisman from Eliphaz Levi. He's obviously illuminated, but this word is Hebrew and actually exists in the Old Testament. And he has it circumscribing a pentagram. So you have the symbol here of the procession. Because that's what this symbol is, a cryptic thing of, and this outside of it, there's an addition to it. Leviathan here, he has uh, resolved a little bit clearer with a snake eating its tail. And the reason he's done that is because Leviathan in Hebrew actually means a serpent that's joined together. You can see serpents joined together. Uh, in antiquity, uh, a lot of esoteric sort of occult lore. This is actually a New Year's card, so it's associated with the turnover of the New Year. You can see here in Hebrew, Leviathan, Happy New Year. Always a serpent or a fish eating its tail. It's a big part of the clock in the heavens because this is the Milky Way. And it's orientated this way around the ecliptic. So this would be the star, the major hand, of this clock. And this will be the lesser hand, which will resolve the hour with the greater clarity. clarity. And here it is. This is Leviathan. Here's the head of the snake right here, the tail going into his mouth, his body. You can look at it a little bit clearer here. The tail going into the mouth. And this actually is galactic central point. This is how you read the clock of doom. The cardinal points of the heavens where the cherubim occupy, that the sign, they don't actually occupy it, but the symbol of them are here. The lion, the bull, the, the Aquarius, the man, and Ophiuchus right here. Right before you hit these cardinal points, you'll actually be able to bisect the whole zodiac twice. And one point here cuts it in half along where the Milky Way is. So you notice, if you have the procession actually taking 25,920 years to go once around, quarterly, when it hits these cherubim points, these cardinal points, it takes 6,480 years. That's just quartering up to the processional year. What happens then is that 
when these signs are aligned to either the equinoxes or the solstices of our year, then we hit what's called the end or the beginning of an aeon. The Greeks actually had a time for the aeon. The aeon, to us, sounds like an ethereal long stretch of time, but the aeon to the Greeks was actually this amount of time, 6,480 years. So you can move through here to here. When that happens, and you're actually on a solstice or an equinox, you know, you get up in the morning, the sun's rising right here between Pisces and Aquarius, you know that something big is going to happen. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening now. This is what it looks like. You get up on December 21st, winter solstice, the sun will rise right there in the mouth of this Leviathan, also called an Ouroboros. Rise right in the center of galactic central point. Crosses right through here. This is the ecliptic. All the planets cross right through this most holy site of the heavens, according to uh, the ancients. And you can see here, this is Sagittarius pointing right to the mouth here. Right before you get to where the proper symbol of Ophiuchus, the serpent holder, would be here. The Greeks would call this actual configuration a suntilia, which means the dividing point. Now, this maps out the dividing points. We're presently in one. They last for around, no, 200 years. I just picked 2012 because it seems to be a popular time for doomsdayer, doomsayers and uh, people who read the Aztec calendar. But if you count back from here, you actually start at the birth of history, 6,480 years, jump back again. The Pleistocene, where all these sites, these megalithic sites, seem to have been destroyed by water which fits perfectly into the idea of Noah's epic, the flood epic right here. Go back again, 6,480 years, glaciers at a maximum sea levels, below 400 feet lower than present. And then you go back before that, another 6,480 years, at the beginning of this whole processional cycle, which will end there or thereabouts, because like I said, it's around 200 years while this sign is, just be, is being displayed you see that all humanoids, at least in uh, paleontology, all homo sapiens died out and the last glacial period began. So this guy, this symbol, Sagittarius, is actually pointing his arrow at Galactic Central Point. He points at the arrow where Leviathan connects. And if you don't know what Leviathan was, you wouldn't think that was so significant, but actually knowing where the tail goes into the mouth of this thing at Galactic Central Point, it's very significant to have this arrow pointing right at it. And those in antiquity who knew things actually realized that about Sagittarius. This comes from an actual tapestry in France made about 1500s. They incorporated Leviathan here in Galactic Central Point with the body of Sagittarius. But this I think is really fascinating. The most ancient depiction of Sagittarius is Nurgle, the god of Mars, to the Sumerians. And this is an artist rendition, actually my brother painted that, of this face in profile. And here's a close up of Nurgle's face in profile. Notice he has two faces. Some say this is a lion. It looks more like a wolf to me, it would still be kind of significant. But he's a cherubim. This back end here, this is a cow, this is a, a bovine. The front, these are paws of a lion, wings of an eagle, and human foreparts, four parts like a human. So he fits a classic design of a cherubim, but he's called the god of Mars by the Sumerians, and he bears this uncanny similarity to the face on Sidonia. Well, Enoch, comes to the rescue again explaining what's going on now in modern times. You have the alien greys, you have uh, what people would say are zeta reticuli or watchers. Enoch explains what's going on with them. He was actually told to explain to them themselves by God what their punishment would be. And he goes on saying here in Enoch 6, the dwelling of the spirits who were born on earth is earth. 
They are called demons. They eat no food, do not thirst, and are not observed. As uh, Dr. Heiser was talking about yesterday, the, the, the Semitic, the Hebrew uh, belief of where the origin of demons come from is that they were the giants that were destroyed in the flood. Enoch fits that here in this sentence. And then he says, but the dwelling of the watchers, the spirits of heaven who were promiscuous with women, is heaven. They, assuming many forms, and that's a salient part there, will lead men astray so that they sacrifice to demons as gods until the great judgment day, until the time of the consummation of their sin. This is the central point of contention. I wanted to add when Dr. Heiser was talking yesterday about what defines divinity, what defines a divine being, and I, I was thinking, could it just be living forever, immortality? I mean, they are different than humans, and they don't live on the earth. They have interaction with us on the earth. But I think what defines, really simply, in a way, a divine being, an angel, is that they are eternal. They weren't always eternal. They were created at one point like human beings, but they have eternal life already. And this is where the contention all started. This knowledge was brought down from heaven by this being, a watcher, the consummate watcher. This fruit that I'm showing has this connection to Mars through symbology, through occult literature, through history, the Cydonia fruit, symbolizing knowledge from heaven, incrementally showing us more and more on how to become civilized, how to somehow overtake this, this curse of being prevented from ever living forever. And then you have, and I used the same phraseology here, I actually picked this because it, the words were actually the same. There's the tree of life, I guess, metaphorically. I mean, I don't have access to this literal tree back in Genesis in the Garden of Eden, but I do have access to understanding this. And metaphorically, I understand this connection. I'm understanding what this is trying to tell me about if I gather more knowledge, if I have more gnosis, someday maybe I'll be able to breach that point between mortality and immortality. I think that's what the contentious point is. I think that's the thing that divides and, and actually defines what the argument is between the angels who've rebelled and the angels who haven't. What's going on with mankind here right now? This could be metaphorically the tree of life because I can actually I can actually take part with this. I can actually go to this. And that's a promise that I've been given as a Christian that I'll live forever because I trusted what God himself did on this cross. Paying for all my sin, all my imperfection. And I think this one sentence says it most clearly. I think this one sentence, you know, and it comes out of the New Testament, but I think it clears up exactly what's going on between angels, the angel, angelic realm, the rebellious angelic realm, and humanity. As it says, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be known, might be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purposes which he purposed in the Messiah, Jesus our Lord. This is a display for them. With this information, no one can actually say, well, the Bible discounts uh, beings in outer space. What this is actually saying is, what's happening on Earth is for their benefit. It's showing them something. Um, it's not all human-centric. It's actually a demonstration on this one planet of something so phenomenal that you could expect a lot of watchers from heavenly realms. Well, thank you very much for your time. I don't know how long I went over, but... <laughs> If there's any questions, <laughs> let me put them down on the card. Thank you. Let me put them down on the card, and then we'll try to like address them during the question-answer session. I think on Monday. Thanks.